Hello, hello, and welcome back to Sinister Sisters. Hello. My name is Kat, and I'm joined by my co-host. Shrimp! <laughs> <laughs> welcome to Soapbox Sundays. Today on our episode, we are going to be talking about simulated realities um, and the theory that we likely are currently living in a simulation. You know, I learned this week that, you know, on The Sims, how their yeah. currency is called simoleons? Yeah. I thought that was a Sims thing, but apparently, like, like a simoleon has been something to do with currency for, like, years. Like, way longer than it was The Sims. But it really? was spelled differently, so that was the funny. It was like, <laughs> simoleon. Instead of, like, with an A or something. I don't know. This is fat news to me. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Yikes! Okay. Well, I like how on The Sims, your Sims can play The Sims. Yeah. It's very funny. This is kind of what we're talking about today. Somebody's probably just, just like, we're Sims. And some somebody's yeah. just playing us. That's what we're about to talk about. Good segui! Have you ever seen The Matrix? No. No. So basically the, the vibe of it is that the main character is just chilling and, you know, whatever, living his life. And then I can't really remember how, but somehow he discovers that his brain is, like, connected to this hive mind thing of all these other humans. And everything he know node <laughs> everything he knew <laughs> <laughs> everything he knew to be like reality was actually simulated by these aliens who were like harnessing his brain power oh <laughs> yeah so the idea that like simulations exist or that are possible is something that's been theorized quite often in philosophy it's not really a new idea um, and more recently, physicists and scientists have become involved to kind of map out if it's actually probable. Elon Musk, our favorite billionaire. Twitter god. Famously claimed in 2016 that it's essentially improbable that we are not currently living in a simulation. Basically what are his that credentials? <laughs> like, what does... Does he have, like... Like, I know he's the PayPal man, but, like, yeah. and now the Twitter man. And yeah. he's also lost, like, $3 billion in shares from Tesla or something like that because Classic. of the acquisition of Twitter. I also yeah. know that he's a blood diamond heir. Blood, blood emerald. Diamond, blood emerald <laughs> mining empire heir. But, like, um. people just say that he's very smart. But, like, what does he know about physics? I think he has a Bachelor of Science and he has a Bachelor of Arts, according to his Wikipedia page. Mm, let's see here. I mean, okay then, maybe he is a scientist. Yeah, he got a Bachelor of Arts degree in Physics and a Bachelor of Science degree in Economics in the 1990s. That's weird. He was accepted bachelor into a... PhD program in materials science at Stanford, but decided to go into tech instead. <laughs> Which, like, probably a good choice for him. But Yeah, but it's the kind of thing you can do when your life is being funded by blood emeralds. This is true. Anyway, so, yeah, he basically claimed... Rewind. So Elon Musk basically claimed that it was like a one in a billion chance that we are not living in a simulation. Gross. So... Yeah, I wanted to do a little bit more research, break things down, and see what our sinister friends thought. Plus, um, you know, if we can prove Elon to be a little bit dumb. <laughs> we love disproving cocky white men, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, first of all, I just wanted to touch on a few, like, older theories. Uh, more kind of ancient, whatever. So... Uh, there's a Plato allegory, but it's just called the cave. 
and it describes a group of people who live their lives chained to the wall of a cave and they're facing a blank wall. Those people watch the shadows that are projected on the wall from objects passing in front of a fire behind them and they give names to these shadows, you know, kind of make up stories for them and things like that. So the shadows are the prisoner's reality, but they're not actually accurate representations of the real world. And so this shows that sometimes, you know, what is perceived is not actually reality. And sometimes our perceptions aren't terribly trustworthy. So the dream argument is like an older theory. And it's the thought that um, the act of dreaming actually provides preliminary evidence that our senses are not um, trustworthy in being able to distinguish reality from illusion and so therefore any state that is dependent on our senses should at the very least be really carefully examined and tested before we can determine if it is actually reality because while you're dreaming you you know typically don't actually realize that you're dreaming right yeah so of course lucid dreaming is a thing but that's something that you have to work towards and you have to plan for and it's not like the standard settings of a dream <laughs> so this has led philosophers to wonder whether it is possible to ever be certain if you're dreaming or not at any point in time and so could we potentially be in a perpetual dream state and never actually know it because it is possible to have a dream within a dream right i feel like i am mentally too frightened <laughs> to have this conversation because i'm about to have an existential crisis already and we're like 10 minutes in I had an existential crisis doing the research for this too. I'll tell you towards the end um, something that I came to think of. My own hmm. little theory. Ooh, hypothesis. Yes. Um, so this dream argument is best known um, to have come from Rene Descartes. Rene Descartes? Descartes. I think so. Yeah. Rene Descartes' Meditations on First Philosophy. Dreaming also provides us a springboard to question whether our own reality may be an illusion. So the ability for the mind to be able to be tricked into believing a mentally generated dream world is the real world means at least one variety of simulated reality is actually common and possible, right? Something that people experience every night. So those who argue that the will is not simulated must at least admit that the mind, or at least the sleeping mind, is not a reliable source for attempting to differentiate reality from illusion. So it's possible, basically. Great. <laughs> well, I am is dreaming and all the strife that I'm going through every day is not even real. <laughs> hey, but doesn't that make it feel easier? Because it doesn't really matter what happens. You know, I just started to convince myself that, like, um, when I'm at work, I'm just I just have to be a sim for eight hours and like <laughs> do my tasks. Yeah, and maybe it's true. Maybe I am just a sim. Maybe. May do you think our Sims, like we we play The Sims a lot, so do you think our Sims like go to work and actually do tasks? No, they don't because no. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. I can't. <laughs> My brain's too confused. <laughs> so the sort of the main theory is just, it's called the simulation theory. And this is the hypothesis that reality could be simulated. So for example, by a quantum computer simulation to a degree that's indis indistinguishable from like quote unquote true reality. It could contain conscious minds that may or may not know that they live inside of a simulation. So the most famous of these theories comes from uh, Nick Bostrom and his two April 2003 paper, which was published in Philosophical Quarterly, which is an actual scientific journal, which I thought was like kind of adorable. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Bostrom argues that while it, at our current stage of technological development, we don't have either powerful enough hardware or the software required to create conscious minds inside of a computer, inside of a computer. Um, he believes that these technical technological barriers will eventually be resolved and possibly as soon as the next few decades. So this was already 20 years ago. 
that he theorized this. So. <laughs> Bostrom states that the amount of computing power needed to emulate a human mind can be roughly estimated. One estimate, based on how much computational power is required to replicate the functionality of a piece of nervous tissue, yields a figure of about 10 to the power of 14 operations per second required to replicate the entire human brain. Which is a lot, but anyway. Is that, okay, I don't, that's 10 times 10, 14 times, right? Mm -hmm. So it's 10 plus 14 zeros. That's so a like, lot. Yeah. Every second. Every second. Yeah. <laughs> so he then goes on to further expand that it is likely that the human central nervous system has a high degree of redundancy in order to compensate for the unreliability and noisiness of its nerve cells. One would therefore expect a substantial efficiency gain when using more reliable and versatile non-biological processes. <laughs> I don't think I even know what that means. So basically, a lot of the things that the human brain does are redundant, and they do them because the world is unreliable, and also our brain's cells themselves are unreliable. So it needs to do extra things just to make sure that it will continue to function if certain nerves give out, basically, or cells give out. You know, when you were saying nervous tissue before, mm. I was thinking um, of, like, a piece of tissue paper with, like, a, like, <laughs> nervous face. Because, like, you know, nervous tissue. But then I was like, no, like brain tissue like, or whatever, the nervous yeah. system. But it's actually doing things just in case something bad happens. Basically, yeah. So our brain has anxiety. Yes, exactly. Nice. <laughs> and so what nice. he's basically saying is that because, you know, we're organic matter, uh, we probably can be created more effectively by using non-organic matters. So like our brain would be more efficient if it was in fact made out of computer parts instead of guts and stuff. <laughs> you have guts in your brain? Whatever. You know what I mean. Squishy gray yeah. things. <laughs> so I'm having an I existential crisis. Am I a person? It's okay. We'll get there. We'll get there. So, um, at the time of the writing of the, the 2003 paper, there was actually a computer scientist whose name was Eric Drexler, and he had outlined a design for a computer system that would be the size of a sugar cube and would perform 10 to the power of 21 operations per second. So that would be more than yeah. enough power to run the human brain. And it's, you know, tiny, right? Relatively small. So, if the environment were to be included in the simulation, that would require some additional computing power. But how much power you would need would depend on the scope and the granularity of the simulation. So, in order to get a realistic simulation of the human experiences, there's not really that much computational power that would be needed. You would only really need to, like, render, quote-unquote, whatever's required to ensure that simulated humans interacting in normal human ways with their simulated environment would not notice any irregularities. So for example, you know, the microscopic structure of the inside of the earth would not need to be rendered. Distant planets and the moon and things like that would just need to be shown in like a two-dimensional format. Shush. Go and lie down. Lie down. Ruining my audio quality. It's weaning. I'm going to rewind a second. So, the microscopic structure of the inside of the Earth would not need to be rendered, and any faraway objects like the moon or Saturn would either not need to be rendered, rendered at all or <laughs> would only need to be rendered in really basic formats right like a two-dimensional view of the moon we only ever see one side of the moon 
from Earth. Also, so it's think- like in The Sims 2 when yeah. you are loading your neighbor or like yeah. you you are in your house and mm-hmm. you go to a community lot, the community lot has to load through a loading screen. Yeah, yeah. Or <laughs> a better example would be when, when you're in Minecraft and you're exploring. And you know, sometimes you get right to the edge of the world, like if you're flying or something and there's yeah. nothing there because it, it hasn't yeah. rendered that piece yet. And so what the, the theory there is that if I'm sitting here, I don't need to, my reality doesn't need to have rendered New York City. If I'm sitting in New York City, my reality doesn't need to render the entire island of Manhattan. It just needs to render what I can see. So is New York even real? Who knows? So the conclusion of Bostrom's theory is that the simulation argument shows that at least one of the following propositions is true. So one, the fraction of human level civilizations that reach a post-human stage, which is essentially just where the technology is at the point where it's able to um, like replicate, that humans reach a point where they're able to create these like simulated realities. So... I'm just, I'll read that again. The fraction of human level civilizations that reach a post-human stage is very close to zero. If this proposition is true, then we will almost certainly go extinct before we reach the level of post-humanity. Great. (laughs) Second proposition is the fraction of post-human civilizations that are interested in running ancestor simulations is very close to zero. So if this proposition is true, then there must be um, very few advanced civilizations that contain enough wealthy individuals who also desire to run an ancestor simulation. And so they haven't. So they either don't have the desire to, don't have the money to, or haven't thought of it, even though they have the technology that could support it. And then finally... The fraction of all people with our kind of experiences that are living in a simulation is very close to one. If this is true, then we are almost certainly living in a simulation. What? (laughs) So those are like his three conclusions from his theory. So either, like the spark knows basically vision of it is that either humans have never and will never reach the stage where they're able to create the technology that's required. So they'll go extinct before then. Or they are able to create the technology, but either don't have the desire or the funding to create these huge human simulations. Or three, we're living in a simulation. Shit. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And so then he went on to say that unless we are now living in a simulation, our descendants will almost never, almost certainly never run an ancestor (laughs) simulation. Yeah. I don't get it. (laughs) What's an ancestor simulation like? Like a simulation... Okay, because if you think about it, if we're currently in a simulation, uh-huh. okay, but we ourselves haven't created the technology to have a simulation ourselves. So what they've done is they've simulated the past, their past. Who? But the future people who've built the simulation. And so they're running a simulation of their their ancestors. Have you seen that video on <laughs> TikTok or on Facebook or Vine or whatever it's from? And it's like the, what weighs more, a bunch of feathers or a bunch of iron? And that dude's just so confused about it. It's a kilogram of steel because it's... steel is heavier than feathers. Yeah, but he's like, or which one's lighter or whatever? And it's like, well, it's got to be feathers. <laughs> and then people are trying to explain it to him and he's like, 
That's how I feel. That's fair. If I can find that video, I'll put that in the in the case, like in the Instagram for this okay. <laughs> episode, if I can find it. Okay. Do you want me to give the spark? I wrote down like a spark note, one sentence version of his theory. Do you want me to yeah, read okay. that out and see if that, yeah. if that gets you? Okay. So the, the theory is that if societies do not self-destruct before they acquire the technology to build a simulation, then it is highly probable that we currently live in a simulation. So because we can't build a simulation, we are in a simulation? Someone else built the simulation for us? If the societies did not self-destruct. Just hold that thought. We'll get. I, I'm going to talk about another theory. I don't think I even have any thoughts <laughs> that I can hold. <laughs> my brain's just blank. My, my brain's blank in it. Okay, so it's um, there's a blank. So fucking blank. It's okay. You'll be thinking about this all night. Your brain will be just like. No, I can't because I'm about to like explode as it is like i can't just i can't think about the fact that we're not real <laughs> yeah but what is reality i don't know <laughs> like if it feels real why does it matter that it's not of course it's happening inside your head harry but why on earth should exactly. that matter? it isn't real but we don't support um the author of that no that what? one was written by harry potter himself yeah it's an autobiography, <laughs> or a biography, whichever one, written by Harry Potter himself. Um, what was I going to say? All of the best things in life are things that we cannot perceive. Like? Things like, like love. That's a feeling. That's not something you can taste or smell or feel with your fingers. Right? It comes from inside. And so that is your brain creating that reality. And that oh doesn't make it any God. more real. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Did I break you? I think so. So a more recent hypothesis came out in 2020 uh, by a Columbia astronomer called David Kipling. So he states that the odds that we're living in the base reality, which is like the pre-simulation, like the real, real world, is about 50-50. <laughs> what? Now there's a world before the simulation? Yeah, The okay, so... Am I let's, stupid? <laughs> let's take it back a step. Maybe I'm not explaining it very well. So let's put it into Sims terms. Okay. So Small you, words. So you Me. are living in the base reality and your Sims are in the simulation. Okay. So the base reality is like the real world, the non-simulated world. But I thought we were in a simulation. Well, this is a different theory now. Oh. Yeah, we're moving on. <laughs> okay. Okay. That would be helpful to remember. So I'll I'll start the sentence over again. <laughs> um, so a more recent 2020 hypothesis by a Columbia astronomer named David Kipling states that the odds that we're living in the base reality, so the real world, the real, real world, are about 50-50. This more recent hypothesis states that um, if humans in this reality were to ever develop the ability to simulate conscious beings, then the chances would overwhelmingly tilt in favor of us two being virtual people inside someone else's computer. So that article had a really large amount of like high, high level mathematical calculations that I didn't understand, but essentially, um, if we act under the assumption that we are in the base reality, then the odds that there is a simulation are about even, 
because we can't really prove either way if we are or not. And we can't really prove at this point in time if the technology is even possible. However, the moment that we are able to prove that the technology is possible, aka by creating a simulation ourselves, then the probability of us living in a simulation is so much higher because we've proven that the technology is possible. That's right? like, I don't know anything about science, but that seems pretty sh like shit science. Well. We're either in a simulation or we're not, and I can only tell you we are if we become <laughs> one, if we build one ourselves. So basically what the idea is, is that the rate that technology has has improved and grown over the last hundred years, it seems really improbable that in the past 2,000 years, we haven't developed this technology that is seemingly at this point only, you know, a few decades away. And so it's improbable. If we can prove that the technology exists and it's possible, then it is improbable that our ancestors did not already develop the technology and then tossed us in the simulation to see what we could do or see if we could get there faster. Oh my god. <laughs> so basically, if the technology exists, then it's probable that it has existed in the past. Because, like, computers only became a thing, you know, in the 1950s, which is not that long ago, in the, like, span of human civilization. Yes. So. It, yeah, if Jesus had a computer, he probably would have already figured out how to make a simulation and would have put us in it, essentially. It, well, yeah, that's what Jesus' dad did. <laughs> this is like the biggest shower thoughts episode. Is religion just a simulation? Is God just playing The Sims? <laughs> Have you ever played Sim City? It's like that vibe, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so as we discussed at the top of the episode, Elon Musk is a really famous believer in this simulation mm -hmm. theory. But another notable theory, uh, sorry, another notable believer is Neil deGrasse Tyson. He's that like nice. physics guy. Yeah. Um, so on an episode of his podcast, which is called Star Talk, check him out. Cute. <laughs> oh Not us God, giving okay. Neil deGrasse Tyson viewers. <laughs> I saw a post, admittedly it was on Twitter, so like take with a grain of salt, that the only place that iron, iron is like in your bones, right? Yeah. And like in your blood, whatever, keeps you alive. But that the only place that it like naturally occurs is in stars mm. and so it, that's like like exploding stars or something so that's cute like we are it is. we, we are, are made of the nature stardust the things that surround us ziggy stardust that's the big bang work today theory. and um it had a pink tail oh anyway that was sweet <laughs> sorry that was real <laughs> <laughs> the Big Bang Theory, that's what, what the Big Bang Theory is, is that something exploded and spent all this space dust everywhere, and that's what created the universe. Seems legit. Seems legit. I'm a flat earther, personally. <laughs> <laughs> Shrimp hates science. <laughs> I can't say that. I'm not a flat no. earther. That's stupid. Yeah. Have you ever been on a plane? Could you see the whole Earth from the plane? No? Okay, well then the Earth's if, not flat. If the Earth was flat, cats would have knocked everything off it by now. <laughs> so Neil deGrasse Tyson is also famously a believer of um, this theory, or was famously a believer of this theory. So on an episode of his podcast, he stated that the simulation would most likely create perceptions of reality on demand, rather than to simulate all of reality at the same time. So like we were talking about with video games, they only render what you can see. Mm -hmm. And other things aren't, you know, like, important, right? Yeah. His co-host then goes on to say that maybe that's why we can't travel faster than the speed of light. Because if we could, then we'd be able to get to another galaxy before they could program it. Right. <laughs> 
<laughs> so there are some people who <sighs> believe that the logic of the initial argument is flawed and kind of try to disprove this. So of course. A 2021 paper by Alexandre Bibo de Lisle at the University of Montreal states that the cost of simulating our environment and the possibility of recursive simula simulations indicates that in most realistic scenarios, the odds are instead in favor of us living in the base reality. Um, so yeah, the idea is that if we're a simulation, then there's many simulations, you know, they like stack on top of each other. Yeah. Um, and then a friend of Neil deGrasse Tyson's called um, J. Richard Gott, who is an astrophysical professor at Princeton, shared a really strong objection to the simulation theory. So this objection points out that the common trait in all of these hypothetical simulated universes is that they possess the ability to produce other simulated universes. Being that our current world does not possess this ability, it would either mean that we are the real universe, and therefore simulated universes have not been created yet, or we are the last universe in a very long chain of simulated universe, which, you know, is an observation that makes simulation seem less probable. Because what are the odds that we're the very last one? What are the odds that we're the only one? <laughs> why can't this why can't this uh world create new simulations because we don't have the technology yet oh yet yet yeah so every but day don't we have the technology on like a small scale because we can create the sims yeah but that's not a simulated consciousness like those aren't simulated oh. humans but yeah. with something like ai is getting to that point Right, AI is not conscious, but it can learn, and so in theory, it could eventually learn how to be a human, to the point where they're indistinguishable from actual humans. Yeah, <laughs> because a lot of things about being a person that you would think to be inherently human, like empathy, are learned behaviors from our parents and our grandparents and other yeah. adults around us. Yeah. So, yeah. Wild. Yeah. Anyway, so everyday, like, sort of non sciencey people who believe in the simulation theory often point to the phenomenon of there being a glitch in the matrix or things that happen that cannot logically be explained mm. as proof that our simulation glitched briefly. So you might see that, like, in a video game, right? Where something. Like when the Sims get all like whoosh, stretched out, yeah, <laughs> and it's then all of a sudden they go back to normal. Custom content, yeah. But eventually the code will write that, um, and so that's kind of the thought that that happens in real life. So mm. I thought since we all seem to enjoy the Reddit stories so much, um, I would read one, just one story of a popular glitch in the Matrix story. And then we'll include some images also in the case file of other glitches. I've seen some really cool ones on Reddit. So we'll include some of those so you can check them out. Um, r slash glitch in the matrix is a really cool, freaky, but cool subreddit. Nice. All right. So um, this story is from an Ask Reddit, whoa, an Ask Reddit post from uh, like nine years ago. Um, and the it's a comment of the, the story is a comment uh, from you slash Hades smiles and so they say me and my friend were at a Chinese restaurant and we ordered a general Tao chicken dinner and a shrimp lo mein dish when we sat down we took out both boxes and set them on the table about two feet apart my friend opens the first box and we see a shrimp lo mein dish it has all the things in there, noodles, shrimp, fried rice. He closes the box, opens the other one. Inside that box is a shrimp lo mein dish. Shrimp, noodles, fried rice. Oh, I think they must have mixed up the order. I was just about to say this when my friend says out loud, 
Looks like they made a mistake and gave us two. He opens up the first box again. Inside it is a General Tao chicken dinner. General Tao chicken, white rice, and an egg roll. He froze and looked at me. I looked back, and we sat in silence. I still have no idea what the fuck happened. Ew. <laughs> Crazy. Very weird. Very, very, very weird. Yep. So. I would literally go insane if something like that happened to me. <laughs> I saw a video once, too, of it was like um, someone, it was on a security camera, camera. They were at their job and they cut a sandwich yeah. and then they put, or a piece of, like a bagel, and then they put it to one side. And then they went to pick it up to put the toppings on it. And the bagel was in one piece. So they had to cut it again. Right? I'd end up in a grippy sock vacation. <laughs> How do people have this kind of shit happen to them and not like fall apart? Because you just, then you're in a simulation. So, right at the beginning of the episode, I talked about how I had a bit of a an epiphany while I was listening to this. Or, cool beans. sorry, researching about this. So, pun? Cool beans? Cool beans, okay. So I'm going to share my thoughts and a little bit of a side anecdote. So I have a friend, and he is very uh, connected to the spiritual world. Yeah, so he's very into spirituality, very connected with the spiritual world. And last time I saw him, he said that... Um, the spirits had told him that the world that we're in right now, this current plane of existence is like extra hard level, extreme level, whatever. Um, and so we're here because we've done so well in previous lifetimes. Cute. So then as I'm reading this, I got to thinking, what if people like my friend who are very connected to the spiritual world aren't actually connecting with like our ancestors or the ghost people what if they're connecting with the people running the simulation? And so that was the person running the simulation being like, hey, you're on extreme mode. That's what this this level is. And when you're finished, we'll take you out. We'll put you in to easy mode. Sandbox mode. Jesus Christ. Yeah. So then I was like... <laughs> That's nice, though. It's nice yeah. to know that maybe one day I'll have an easy life. Yeah. I found that really comforting, too, when he told me that. It was, it was good. Yeah. But anyway, Because so. if we're in this plane of existence on extra hard, extreme, I want to kill myself, um, it's because we survived. It's because we survived. And we were meant for this difficulty. We've proven we can do it. And this is the last level before the we get the boss. easiness. This is the final boss, I think. It was kind of the vibe. <laughs> Thank fuck for that. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, that's all I have for today. I hope not too many people's minds are now melting. <laughs> Mine is. Um, so if you liked this episode, you can check us out on Instagram. Uh, we'll have the case file there where we'll have some some images and some, you know, kind of supplementary items um, that you can take a look at. So our Instagram is at sinistersisters.podcast. You can follow us on TikTok at sinistersisterspodcast. We post little snippets of the episodes on there. And eventually we will post fun content <laughs> from other aspects of our lives on there as well. Hopefully. Hopefully. Because Kat's um, going to move to the same city as me. Yeah. Oh, I stabbed myself. Ouch. Um, you can check out the video episodes on YouTube. Uh, and our username is Sinister Sisters Podcast. You can send us an email at SinisterSistersPod at gmail.com. And you can check out in either the video description or the um, episode notes our case request form. So you can use that to send us in topics that you might like us to cover, either for Shrimp's True Crime Tuesday episodes or for my Soapbox episodes. That's also um, in the Instagram bio. Also in the Instagram bio, yeah. And 
yeah, send us messages, connect with us. We like to hear from people who've listened to our episodes and what they thought. Yeah. Sinister Mum has been letting us know how much she likes them. So we love Sinister Mum. We do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so Bye. much for listening, everyone. 